I don't know where else to say this. No one believes me. No one that hasn't seen it already. But I have to say something, so here it is. And the world can decide. I was a good worker. I showed up for my shifts and did what my written job description said. Never missed a day or a chance for a day off. My goal was to be average, to not be good enough to be noticed and to be given more responsibilities, but also not be bad enough to be noticed and put on watch. It's what I've done all my life. Fly under the radar, be easily missed during inspections and blend into the crowd. I got B's in school, had no intention of going to college or university, not like I'd ever be able to afford it. Just wanted a secure job to let me afford my underachieving lifestyle. It took me almost 10 years to find something like that, drifting from one job to another, leaving when too many people started to notice I was much better at the job than I let on. And eventually I found the perfect fit for myself. I was an overnight security operator. Don't get excited. It's a fancy title for spending all night watching security monitors for a commuter train. I can't say which one or where for the safety of others and myself. The job was simple. Watch the camera feeds of my designated train and write a report for anything unusual. On a rare occasion, make a statement to the police. And I mean, rare occasion. In my five years doing that job, I spoke to the police maybe twice before the incident. I think that's enough background, so on to the point. It was a regular Thursday night. The shift started at 10 p.m. Working with Larry, Bob, and Sue, not their real names for their safety and more importantly mine, watching the cameras. Made some notes. A forgotten umbrella. Wasn't raining. A camera glitch. A group of four drunk men. A person in a hoodie doing the drug addict lean. You know the one. The camera glitch was expected. An extension to the rail line was recently completed, which included a very long tunnel through a hillside, which about the middle of it was so deep that the cameras would cut out for about two to three seconds. It was actually pretty amazing that we got any signal from the trains in the tunnel at all. The wonders of signal boosters. But something about that night caught my attention. I didn't know what it was at first, just felt something was off. I ignored it that night because at 3 a.m. everything feels weird. At the end of the shift, at about 9.30 a.m., I made my report for the night, handed the desk over to Bill, again not their real name, and went home on the same train system I monitored. But the feeling was still in my head. Something happened on the train that night that I wasn't consciously aware of. I ignored it still, drank my favorite cheap whiskey and went to bed. The feeling stayed with me the next few days. That damned feeling when you know something isn't right but you can't figure out what. It's like when you accidentally put your phone in a different pocket than normal. So, finally on Monday night, you have no idea how busy security monitors get on weekends. When my trains were in the depot, getting cleaned, I brought up the Thursday night footage and scrolled through it. Same things I made note of were there, but the feeling was still there. So I went through it again, and again. The fifth time through, I finally found it. On the third wagon, almost in the blind spot between the cameras, at 2.58 a.m., was a regular person just playing a game on their phone. The camera glitched for two seconds, and they were gone. I thought maybe they just moved completely into the blind spot, but no. They were gone. Didn't get off the train. Didn't reappear. I checked the entire recording of the night. I had no idea what to do. I should have told someone, or made a report, or anything. Instead, I told myself that was really weird and kept doing my thing. Flying under the radar, trying to be mostly invisible. Two weeks later, on Monday night, I saw it again. The camera glitch and someone disappearing. I scrolled back the footage to make sure. Again, I did nothing. This time, telling myself it was just shadows on the lens or the plastic bubble around the camera was dirty. But you know what they say. Once is odd, twice is a coincidence, thrice is a pattern. The third time I did something. I made a report. Yeah, real brave, I know. Making a comment about shadows on the lens after tunnel glitch on my daily report. But that night, I started looking into missing people cases. Larry asked what I was doing. I said reading the news while my train was getting cleaned. Better than Bob, who was usually watching YouTube and or playing games on his phone while his train was still making rounds. Anyways, I found some leads. Three missing people, last seen heading to the public commuter train before disappearing. But there were more. So many more. 
Dozens over the past several years, all last seen heading into the area above the new tunnel. Unsurprisingly, they had all been alone at the time. I won't go into detail about how this troubled me for nearly a year. Just know that eventually, curiosity got its way. On a night off, I got my jacket and went out to a train station. Late spring night, a bit colder than preferred. 2 a.m. train. The last circuit before this train would make for the depot for maintenance and I was on it. It would take nearly an hour to reach the tunnel and I was scared, but I had to know. Like all those times you watch or read some horror and the character starts reaching for the obviously dangerous thing, you mock them endlessly. But I understood now. Fear of the unknown is strong and just seeing what is obviously evil will help you put it out of your mind. But I knew the rules. Be ready to run. Have two exits planned. Don't look back. I sat near the door because I didn't want to stand the whole time. And when the train finally barreled into the tunnel, I started to regret my choice. It was nearly a mile long and just enough room for the train and a very brave worker on each side. I watched my watch 2.59 a.m. and ticking closer to 3 a.m. Tick, tick, tick. Who knew a 20-year-old analog watch could be so ominous? But then my watch stopped. I looked out the windows and the train had stopped. Not rolled to a stop like trains need to do, just complete dead stop and I didn't notice. But the lights on the walls were stretched out, the effect that you can only see when you're moving past them really fast in the dark. My first thought, being a sci-fi fan, was that time stopped, yet I moved. Then I heard a scream and footsteps at the end of the train behind me. I thought about the rules of survival I made and then thought about time being stopped. Would the doors open? Would I be safe jumping from the train? I've seen what happens when someone gets clipped by a train, one of the reasons I had to speak to police. And it's messy. I heard another scream, desperate and afraid. Then the sound of someone tumbling to the floor and something scratching over the floor. A phone bounced off my foot and spun to a stop in front of me. I looked down at it as the screams behind me grew more horrified and pained. I dare to look at the window to see the reflection of what was happening, and the best I can explain is smoke pouring over someone, but it was completely shredding the person, like a blender but not making a noise and vacuuming up the shreds. Some mental fortitude I didn't know about kept me from puking and stay still. The screams eventually came to a wet, gurgling end, and in the reflection, I saw a pair of lights flick on in the smoke. Looking back, they were eyes, but in the moment, they were two neon blue lights looking at the window, then making eye contact with me in the reflection. I held my breath. The smoke soundlessly glided up the aisle and I kept still, not moving at all, keeping my eyes exactly where they were focused before. It drifted closer and closer to me, and by God I wanted to cry. It hovered there, letting me catch a scent, and I want to say it smelled like something burning, or like rot and death, or anything bad. But it was worse so much worse. It smelled like cooked pork, lightly burnt. It hovered for what felt like hours beside me. I was desperate for air. My eyes were burning from not blinking, and those neon lights were staring into my soul. Then the train wobbled as it passed a bend. I have no idea when the thing disappeared or when time resumed. Felt like I blacked out for a moment, but I know that's not what it was. I sat there in my seat, blinking and breathing deeply to recover. And then I looked down. The phone was still on the floor near my feet. I left it there, but I kept staring at it. Like when you notice broken glass on the ground and focus on it so you can avoid stepping in it. At the next station, I got off the train and went to an always open fast food place. I got a coffee and started writing this. It would be two hours until a train back towards my apartment, one that takes the old long route around the tunnel. I didn't sleep that day. How could I after watching someone get shredded and devoured? So I sat at my PC and wandered through my games library all day. Think I fell asleep a couple times for maybe an hour. Next night I went to work like normal, focused on my usual behavior, but after two hours I was called into my supervisor's office. It was relatively normal. They check in with night shift people every few months to make sure we're doing okay, see if we want to change to day shift for mental health was all normal until he put his clipboard down and off to the side. He took a deep breath and looked at me, like really looked, that deep penetrating look when someone can see through your lies. 
You saw it, he said. Three simple words that felt like he was telling me I had a fatal, incurable illness. I just nodded. You have two choices now, like all of us that know. Either you leave and find a new job and never speak of the incident because you will be a suspect in the disappearance, or you keep doing your job as you always have, but with a raise to ignore the camera glitches. I sat for a while, assuming I had to make a choice then and there. That conversation has been burned into my brain. I still remember it verbatim, and I wish I could say I made the morally correct choice. But I'm an underachieving coward, always looking to take the easy path. So, I still watch the cameras through the night, but with some extra money to ignore the occasional camera glitch on the extension. I found out accidentally that Larry and Sue also knew about the incidents and made the same choice I did. And we all knew the same amount of nothing, and we prefer it that way. So that's why I'm putting this out there. Maybe someday someone better than me can figure this out. I still can't eat pork.